Actually, it's funny because my first job when I came to America, I was working for a shipping company. So I'm going back to the containers <laughs> in another way. So I, I, I built you know, a system for container tracking worldwide, EDI, C++, Java. Actually, C++ and, and SQL. Not fun. <laughs> Anyway, if I had the middle that I have today, it was much, much, much easier life. Anyway, so um, uh, what I would like to discuss, you know, if, uh, this is my, my contact, just in case you want to get in touch with me, hey Petroni, uh, Red Hat or Gmail, also, also LinkedIn. So this is what I would like to discuss, provided we have time. So uh, discuss a little bit of the origin, open source project, and uh, the underlying, the derived uh, open shift uh, project, which is uh, led by Red Hat. So uh, as always, Red Hat works in the community, in the open source. What we do, we pick one of the projects that we deem is interesting for a uh, commercialization point of view, of course, because we need to sustain Red Hat. And also, um, we want to take the open source, our, our remit is always taking open source and bringing it into the enterprise to make it more res resilient, re reliable, more secure, and eventually create a baseline that becomes then supported for you know, seven or 10 years, depending on the product, right? And so while we are, we are now um, hardening the code that comes from the open source community, what we call the upstream, Right? We then find problems, we fix it, and we contribute back to the community. That's like a total quality process. So by doing so, in certain uh, type of project where we are mostly active, becomes automatically kind of, you know, the more, the more you are into the project, the more you have ability to steer the, the roadmap. So our customers, they want a the feature, we bring the feature back into the community, into the, into the committees and the working group, and they, they are set to have this feature you know, part of the of the project will revert back into the process, kind of a, a, an interesting group. This is happening <coughs> foremost for the most important product of ours is Red Hat Operating System Linux. But it's been also happening for the same way for all the products that we embrace. Maybe you heard about JBoss, Middleware, for example, or Manage IQ. And uh, so going back to a little bit what we're gonna do, um, Quick overview of the fundamentals of the platform, the OpenShift and origin. Uh, they are based on, on, so, on open source product and project uh, and derived from Kubernetes, led by Google, and also Docker, that is led by the community and also Docker. And I'd like to touch base on what is all for us as developers, more than platform, even though I need to, I'm, I'm forced and I think it's better if we go and discuss how it does it work before we understand how we can take our application and, and, and make it work in the cloud. And then understanding what is the lifecycle management with open, with open ship, and hopefully to run a demo, my bad mistake to restart the computer, I don't know if it's gonna work anyway, let's try. All right, so um, is any other offering from Red Hat, to you, who's using Red Hat? Few, few of you, probably your company are using, um, again, Unix is pretty popular nowadays in Linux. So as any other project that is, is, uh, is, is considered by Red Hat is a set of upstream projects that are part of that eventually one of the products. So the left, right hand side is the OpenShift Enterprise Red Hat product offering the device from the origin open source. So you can run origin on your computers as you can run Red Hat as well. If you want to run enterprise Red Hat, easily in the evaluation mode, but we want to run in production. So we ask, of course, the subscription. So we offer you support. We certify the platform. And so our effort is somehow paid by the fact the company subscribe to uh, buy a subscription from Red Hat, which they can keep it one year, and if they like the support and the service that we do, they keep renewing the subscription. If they want to, they can essentially just you know keep using the software. It's open source, once again, right? Uh, so it's not proprietary, right? And then, of course, what happens if you don't like to, to continue the subscription, you can receive a patch from us, or you can, receive, you can open a ticket to Red Hat, because you are kind of decided not to, uh, so to take our support. So it's a very easy model. 
Um, open source can be consumed in three ways. is software, first of all, for the enterprise. It's also a dedicated offering. What dedicated essentially is you can use this platform that is hosted somewhere in the cloud, and, off, and Red Hat operates for you like a managed service. So you just use the service like a, like a SaaS model, right? Like you use Salesforce. And eventually, uh, Red Hat is behind to operate for you if there are errors or problems or, or you need some help. Some, 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 you know. um, this is the dedicated. Dedicated means it's available on the cloud, but the machines are ready for you. It's a single tenant piece of data center only for you. If you go to the public offering, the online, instead, this is also to major cloud providers like Amazon. So you're still using a managed service, but it's multi-tenant, so you can expect the same type of performance that you have when you're running C2 or Google, for example. It's available on Google platform, um, launching this week, and has been available on, open, uh, on Amazon for the past five years. All right, so um, why origin? So the need for, what is the need in devolution and innovation in what? Essentially, there are three major categories, right? One is the application development life cycle. We would like to bring application into production a quality a little faster, as fast as we can, because we have pressure from competition, also from business, to release new capabilities faster. So again, it don't, it don't mean maybe this platform we can use the same technique that we've been using in corporation in, on, in any other, on any other you know, little company. You have your own pipeline, you are developing and testing. Uh, but the point is, if we are able to automate at the most, we can get the best speed. Um, it's all about processes, of course, right? Agility is definitely the newest way to manage a product and a, and a project. Uh, if we have something that enables us to develop faster and also brings a process in place that we can manage or monitor, is something that we would like to see. And more, moreover, is if we're able to define the way how it runs this, this infrastructure, how does it operate, how does it scale, how does manage the security aspect, right? So if you take these three aspects, this is a huge, huge, it's actually our profession, right? We are a little bit of project manager, we are a little bit of developer, and sometimes we even operate a little bit, or at least we intervene with operation when something doesn't go as expected. Um, there are many people that are very excited about this technology. It's kind of, I wouldn't say every stage, because you already are in production, that means it's serious, I think, right? And there are companies like Google been using this technology for the past decade, right? Google launches two billion containers a week in production, so it's real, right? Uh, it's based on, on Borg and Kubernetes now and their own version of containerization. So um, many people are trying to do themselves. Is for an engineer, it's fascinating. There is a lot of work to be done, though. And appealing a little bit, what it's all about. It's not just you know taking an operating system and uh, running containers as we can do easily with the Docker command, right? Docker run, image, you're done. Well, this is one application. But what about when you need to not need to start building all the images, like a stream of them? Imagine you have other project, you start building the images, right? So yes, it can be done manually with a lot of scripts. Uh, and what about then when we need to deploy these images, right? So we have these images in these repositories, and then finally we say, okay, okay, I like this image, run it somewhere, right? This is deployment. And describing how to run again many applications, it becomes tedious. How we bring into a scale, scale what I mean, like how can we industrialize this process? Whereas if I have one application, it's okay. If I have 10, or if I have 100, I shouldn't have a 10 or a 100 times the effort to do as I do for one. It doesn't, work, it doesn't work this system. So I need a way to describe this type of processes. Um, moreover, now that we are finally able to package, create an image, deploy at the runtime, time, we also want to manage the way we roll over new features, so we don't want our big bang approach, would be that the platform able to do canary deployment, for example, would be the platform would allow us to allow it to to do you know A B type of deployment. There are many ways, B G A B, 
red, green, red, everybody has their own version. Meaning point is, if I have under application running other instances, I have this new version, what is my strategy is to now bring into life this new application and, and rolling forward and taking away whatever is running without creating any disruption or at least as possible from the end consumer, right? So it's a continuous de development and continuous integration concept. Now, um, as Reza mentioned, all is fine when it's one app, but one you need to combine most of the application together, many application, there where the problem is. So there where the orchestration comes in, meaning I have a Java application that runs with maybe a piece of middleware somewhere because I need to connect to a database, and maybe I need to communicate to messaging systems, and maybe I need to you know, talk to Hadoop, to an Hadoop backend to do some crunching numbers. When you compose all together, it becomes way complex. Right? Imagine scaling this now and managing all this. What about having a component that I can put in a library where I can find and we can reuse across, right? Do I have a way to componentize and put on a shell so it's reusable within the organization? This is typical of kind of the SOA world dream, right? Where I have a service finally defined and is a very with good specification and interface, I put it somewhere and then I can finally use it. Otherwise, what's the point to do SOA if you can reuse the services? Now services are running everywhere and the next problem is how do I know where they are? So how we discover them, how we know if they're coming or going or failing or restarting. So how do I search them? How do we discover them? Are they inside the corporation, outside the corporation? Now can I connect to a safe force outside, in the meantime, you need to go into the database inside. So there is a lot of stuff to be done, and there is a lot of operation to be done in here. Now, finally, the way we go out, this is just platforming, platforming, and platforming. Um, we would like, finally, to you know, reuse, right? Architecture, frameworks, um, and finally provide all these goodies to the business lines where they can potentially use through maybe a self-service catalog. All right, to do all this can be done, right? It's a lot of work, it's a lot of stuff. There are challenges to do yourself, so uh, there are people that have been thinking about it. All what I said is there is way more. This diagram explains, of course, that you know the container orchestration is how to combine and underneath. Have you been discussing about networking? How do I interconnect all these Docker containers of application, how do I perform the way I can persist state, right? Not all the application are the pure stateless Java application. I need to somehow also recover state. So how do I touch to storage when everything is running around the cloud? Where, how, where do I put my image? Are they secure? Are they safe? There is a sanity check involved. Are we willing to run everything from anywhere? As we don't run any software from the internet, Saying we, saying we should be very aware to run a Docker image from Docker Hub, because Docker Hub is the internet, so right? would you like to run a Docker Hub in your production system? Maybe not, right? So we need to manage security. Uh, again, how, when we run, I want to monitor all this, right? All the management, the login management, I have a zillion, a continuous maybe now. And one of the problems we, we saw, right, if we have one server in the 1990s, Eventually, in our decade, past decade, we had maybe eight VMs per server, right? We have a proliferation of the sprawl of VMs. Now, going to the next tier, where we don't have only one host and times eight VM, let's say. Now, for every host, I might have 100 or 200, 300 containers. So, imagine a data center now having thousands of machines. We get into the millions of these particles or containers running, coming down, going up shifting around. We need to also be able to manage and track all this. On top of this, finally for us, we would like to see Python where we can manage development, QA testing, and eventually promotion. Can we automate the most? If we can do so, we can do like Google does. You check out a Gmail application, the Gmail application, you change one line of code, right? Setting the pixel on the right hand corner, right? And you check back in. Well, Google, understand this and when you check in you start this mega testing like millions and millions of regression testing around through the cloud and if everything passes your code your version your baseline can finally get promoted into the next staging 
or at the most you could even go live in production because if you deem that all your testing is very accurate in theory every every little new feature that you're implementing could be potentially going production by itself this is what kind of the new generation the new company like the netflix the uber are able to embrace because they cannot reinvent themselves in terms of defining the process and so goes which language are we supporting? Or is that Java only? Maybe we need specific language for a specific tier. We know that web or front ending might not be suitable for certain language, where back ending could be maybe done in other languages. So we need a platform that is able to support almost all the languages we hear nowadays. The, the alternative is to look into people that have been thinking about this and are concentrating in the platform and rather to spend most of the time in working in the platforming business. Linux operating system is probably the most known product, middleware, and this is uh, another, uh, another kind of major industry <coughs> we are undertaking for, very strategic for us and for our customers. So security, telemetry, storage, orchestration is all about what we take from the community and we hard for the enterprise. Down even to the operating system, whereas not only Red Hat is able to run the platform, but we have a specific cut of the operating system called Atomic, Atomic Host, which is, will be essentially the best way where to run containerized workload. All right, so um, this is the architecture, how the platform it is inside. It's probably 80% of Kubernetes. If you have seen Kubernetes, it's kind of a repeat, so I'm gonna go very quick. I'm gonna explain maybe one step at a time because it's very complex, this image is kind of uh, too much to digest. So everything starts where we run, where we run our bits and we need to decide. We wanna run a physical box, fair metal, over over this system, or maybe we have a virtual place, right? We have maybe VMware or any other virtualization system. Or maybe we have a private cloud where we spin off an instance of any compute node and we launch something. Or even more, maybe we can use the economy of scale of Google Cloud, Amazon, Azure. Our choice and our kind of, you know, really remit is to make your workload to run everywhere. And this is very, not that easy. Imagine that we've done a lot of certification among all the virtualization platforms, among most of the, of the private cloud, including OpenStack, of course, that we participate very actively, and also on the public cloud. So nowadays you can run on Amazon, on Google, and Azure. So the containment of the, the, this running containers in Kubernetes is a concept of a, of, a, of, a, of a pod, and the pod runs within an, actually, sorry, a node. A node is conceptually kind of like a machine, and application services running Docker, running the Docker runtime, running to these pods. The pod is represented by a, a, the image inside the node. So pods are conceptually the way we wrap an image. We take it, we have like this Docker runtime, and we run it, and we encase into it. Encasing this allows us to define a perimeter, a boundary, and this is the runtime boundary for, for an application running. Again, a Docker image get, get launched into a container, which is the kind of a Docker recipe, and then translating into having a pod running in, into, your, um, into your platform. All the images are stored securely in a place called the registry, and the master node is the brain where everything is being orchestrated, and also where all the API uh, are managed, so you can actually communicate with this platform through API or command line or even a Google and a web GUI. We need to also manage, uh, it's not easy to read actually, I don't understand why, but anyway. Uh, all the data store management is done by the master, so when you attach a volume, so you need to persist your database, the master will take care of it. Um, the schedule is the most important component, probably, given the fact that I want to launch something. The schedule will decide, okay, I want to take a node in the cluster, I see what is the workload, and we see what is the load, and I place it there. And eventually, um, the, the work placement is, uh, is very carefully uh, checked by the fine, or by the policy that the fine system. Now, then, uh, I didn't mention that. Uh, 
the Kubernetes recipe and Docker itself um, allows you to run a software in a specific IP space. And again, it's networking, right? Every container has its own IP, like if it were, like if it were a machine or a VM. Imagine the complication of the two Docker containers talking to each other with different IPs. You need something in between. We, you need a network, right? Or routes, you know, information uh, back and forth. So the way we do in, uh, in OpenShift and in Kubernetes, we define a service. A service is a facade, right? So we essentially, this is where we define our architecture. Services like the DSOA architecture, right? We define services. So every component talks to a service or exposes itself as a service. If a part goes away, right? Um, the cluster understands if allows look, there are probes running around, and what happens the scheduler reacts. You know what? The, uh, uh, the, the instruction was to have maybe two instances running all the time, and now I have one. And in order to reach back my 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 goal, I go back I go back and spin up and up and else. Right. So again, services can talk to each other finally in the cluster, but sometimes we need to expose out our services to the world. And we introduce a new concept called routing layer, right? So a route is a, is a way to connect an external system into the cluster, right? To communicate into. So if you see routing, service layer, there is a lot of also virtualization within the pods. It's a pretty complex, actually, platform. There is a lot of concept within routing, filtering, and uh, also software-defined networking, which is embedded into the platform. But finally, what is all about uh, the platform for us as developers? It is a set of tools. This is where actually OpenShift kind of becomes a, a relevant value on top of the pure platform for Kubernetes and Docker. So um, the entire CI and CD pipelines, so continuous integration, continuous development is managed by the platform itself. So we can just check the code into the, the life cycle is we check code into a repository, a code repository, and the platform takes care of all the phases that you that needs to be done based on our perspective approach. How do we interact with the, the platform? There are two ways mostly. Uh, one is through uh, the OC CLI, open shift client uh, li um, command line, but also a web GUI on the right, actually the word has been wrapped by the definition on the screen. So we have actually a full GUI that allows to introspect the platform, understand what's going on, and eventually also um, a full-fledged REST API, very rich API. So what happened, the platform is always listening to the external world and monitoring what's going on. And we instruct the platform by saying, now, this is a new definition of a pod. All right, this is a new definition of a service. Stick this pod into this service. This definition has to be object that we ingest into the platform, either through an API or through command line. And this creates the state of the entire platform. So this, the platform knows what is there in terms of inventory, what needs to be done, in, 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 and what needs to be done in, in case something happened by defining some triggers. If you think it's kind of a mix of a monitoring and workflow together. So again, as a developer, what I can well, how can I use this platform to accelerate my, my development life cycle? I can um, I can use components that are part of the platform itself. I can put in the platform, for example, middleware. So when I'm running an application and developing an application, I will have a component that I pick up from my catalog, for example, the database, right, of my messaging system. Uh, or I can uh, integrate with other tools, and I can finally automate my delivery process in the different stages. So this is a typical workflow for DevOps workflow. Um, so as a developer, I'm writing the code, I'm putting it into the source code, right? Uh, by default, the platform is able to talk uh, to GitHub, for example, or even internally running your corporation outside. And then eventually, um, 
the plasma understand the channel as you're putting into the report that is intelligent enough. This is really, for example, an extension from our lab we call source to image. We go into your repository, and say, oh, this is a G3 application. So, um, and then introspecting, the, the platform introspect the, your, 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 your project. So what it does, the understanding is to pick up maybe a J2E server, application server, and combines your code to the J2E and creates an image that is ready to be deployed. The image, the image is pushing a placeholder registry. So now we have completed the clear phase. The Docker layer comes in, and when we are starting to deploy, uh, we take the image out of the repository, and finally we push it to the cluster, and we run it. Right? And the way we run is defined by a deployment instruction or the deployment configurator. For example, we can say run this instance 10 times because I want to scale it 10. Or if I see more load coming in, auto scale to whatever needs to be done. I can also fully automate and say, you know, I am tying the source control system into the workflow, the platforms, and if you see any change happening, repeat this again. This is what we are able to automate everything. So for every new push you do in the repository, when you check, when you check in your code, this process repeats, and we keep track of every step, right, as a platform. This allows essentially to deliver, you know, continuously build and deliver into a product that it could be, for example, the development. Now, if we extend this with the techniques that we are usually in general in a, in a life cycle, we attach maybe a Jenkins engine that understands how to stage it through, right? We can repeat, right? We can use uh, another pipeline where we take out from a, a, a registry that is the development registry, we apply some testing in automation, and if we think everything is fine, we push back into the registry with some tags. The tags would be UIT tags, right? And so it goes, right? You can essentially create a cascading effect until you could potentially bring your bits all the way to production, because now they pass all the testing information. Finally, when we have everything in the registry, we can even decide the way we want to deploy and roll out the application. We can do one by one. We can do maybe a testing. So if 10 applications are up and running, I want to test only one. So I can, I can tell the, the platform, just put a can canary deployment meaning I kind of put the new instance only and I divert part of my traffic coming from the route, right? Only 10% of the route, the traffic goes to the new application and I have a way to get some feedback from my UAT or maybe a user, right? It's very useful for web application where you see if, for example, by having the application itself, a way to get feedback back, like stars, for example, the rating. I know if a feature is liked or not by my end users. If I don't like, I just roll it back, right? I have all the images catalog in my register. I can roll back, roll forward any time in the command. Hey, Alessandro, the webhook, are you just using it just like an event engine? Yes, yeah, so the webhook is a capability in general of a, of a source control system. In this case, for example, GitHub, if you go on GitHub.com, there is a place where you have webhooks. So what it's all about, the web this is a way for you to kind of register a callback, essentially, right? So when GitHub knows that you are committing a new, uh, a new, a new, a new right. set of updates, GitHub will send, will invoke a call. It happens to be, of course, an HTTP REST call that it, it you're should basically be. a poor man's message broker. Yeah, it's a kind of a, yeah. kind of a reactive message broker okay. concept, right? Yeah. But it's done usually by the source control. Right. Okay. Now, right. if, it, if this, this system is not available because it needs to be enabled by the source control, you have a way to ingest. So you can instruct the platform, for example, you know, look into the registry and see, do you see any updates? And automatically will find out if there is anything, anything new. So rather than be pushed, you just kind of pull the pull update. And it's a matter of the activity, nothing else. It's just a choice. OK, so there are many ways we could build application, but I wanted to show you, essentially, that with the ability to use the, the tooling, you can easily uh, create an entire application just with a simple common line that is a new app. So open, open shift, CLI, new app. 
And you can have different type of uh, um, approaches here. For example, I can decide, I can define, this is my location of the source code. It could be a, a directory, it could be maybe a git URL on the web. For only your enterprise, of course. And then I, I can tell, or I can tell this is an image already prepared in the, in the registry, or maybe in, in any registry that would maybe published for a third party company. And so what this new app does, it, it understands if you are talking about I want to launch, a, I want to build the source code first before launching it and packaging, or maybe I, I want to run an image that's already prepared, right, in the registry. Uh, it automatically detects the type of code that is inside the registry. So is that a Java application? Is that a PHP? Is that a Perl application? So we have defined, this is where that, we have defined a lot of ways to probe and detect your code by looking at patterns. Typically what we look at, we say the POM file, if it's a G2E, we look at the recipe, uh, the requirement.txt, if it's a .js, right? So we honor, let's say, eight or nine, including .net, by the way, the news for who, has, who, has, who didn't follow, Red Hat and Microsoft finally bodies, whatever. <laughs> we we'll, we'll always be, you know, kind of not that friendly with each other. Now we have big bodies because there is a big, big collaboration between Microsoft and, uh, and Red Hat. OpenShift run on Azure, and for, for more, uh, more interesting, actually, .NET applications are running now on the supported system. People always wanted to see .NET running on the it's happening, it's going to be a long process because .NET is a very big type of library and it's also very aged, so there are pieces of .NET that are the modern one. And this is all happened when Microsoft open sourced .NET, like two years ago, Red Hat looked into it and, and we, we, we thought, you know, why not try to enable .NET to be run over Linux? Because it's something that our customers would like. And now this is available, it's available also over the cloud. So uh, finally, we understand the code, we build it, we package it, and we create a container <coughs> image, we put it in the registry. But also, this, this little command, what it does, we understand that we might want to run it, so we create a, a deployment configuration element. That means, you know, we take an image and run it somewhere. This is what the way that you should run it. And then, um, and then eventually, also I'm going to create the need, I'm going to create the interface for you, the service, the service console, right? So because every application is only accessible to a service layer, so the service conceptually is a proxy, right? It's a proxy of something that is running in the enterprise with a, its own specific IP, and I have a specific place that is discoverable with a certain entry point, and. This proxy does two things, reroute, reroute the flow of, it, of, a, of a call coming in, or also, since now is a proxy, I can definitely use as a load balancer, so it's very easy to scale out. I just essentially instantiate many times my application, and the proxy, given the strategy, will say load balance in round robin, <coughs> rather than stick with subsession IDs, as you would do with J2A application, right? So this is all built in the platform for you. Now, we understand the load balancing rally. Those are concepts that are now being implemented for a while. And there are also specific infrastructure pieces that you have in your organization. You really have firewalls and right that have files and Cisco's. So you decide, either we do for you in software, software-defined networking, or you can leverage your own infrastructure, it's up to you. Those are opportunities. For example, if you run on Google Cloud, there is no need to despite the define a route because the Google Cloud itself enables you to find routing, to find, so they actually instantiate something that they already have in the fabric. But if you run in your data center, in my laptop, I don't have an F5, I don't have a load balancer, I can use the software version only that is included in the platform. Okay, so finally, what is more interesting in my view is, beside the process of building, is the, the process of sharing everything. Once I have an application, I define, I define the way to build it and to aggregate all the pieces together. I can create a recipe, what is called a template. A template is kind of a, a, a big YAML file or a JSON file that explains all this, explain how to build the pieces, how to connect the pieces, how to create the services, how to create the routes, how to, to react to any type of occurrence. It could be an update, it could be a configuration change, and the system is fully described in one place. 
This, if you think this is a recipe, I think I can literally take this application template and give it to a place. There is a catalog where I can even browse, as it was like a catalog on, on, on goodies on Amazon, right? Or, or maybe I can take this template and throw it over to the next platform or just package it to my consumer, my developer who want to use my service. So this is becoming very interesting. It's not only a service point like in SOA architecture where we define maybe an XML file. No, it's a full recipe how to build, how to deploy, how to monitor, and how to run anywhere. And for more interesting, now the, the, the platform itself is not just the way to run, the platform is now fully featured with third party components that can be onboarded into the platform, either within, uh, let's say, Red Hat itself, for example, has now enabled all JBoss speedover to be run on this platform. So you need a messaging system, AMQ is there, you need a business process engine is there, you need a VPN component is there, you just pick it, right? And you use it, and you can combine it with the syntax. This is a syntax that say, this is my Java application that needs to run on the enterprise application platform server. It's a J2E component from Red Hat, conceptually like Wildfly is the open source. And also, I want an MySQL. MySQL, by the way, runs on Linux certified, right? And this is my combined application. And by the way, since I need to connect all these pieces, I might use environment variable is the way that we can combine things. And with, with, with this line only, I'm able to build an entire stack that is comprised of a database, a J2E server, and some J2 code that I need to write finally. So would that run within a single pause? All right, this is a great question. So I can define if I want running a single pod. The, the answer would be best way to granularize yes would be safe. The point imagine that is any of these components would if I had to fail one of these components, would make sense this application to be live? So if you do believe that that service that is comprising of these three entities that needs to be all up and running at the same time, you would confine me to a pod. Definitely yes. Even further, you can have, so in this case, it would be one pod with three containers with them. Or also you can decide, I can run different pods, provided they are connected together, I don't care. And there is an opportunity, for example, to scale independently every piece. For example, I know that this application is heavily loaded on the SQL because of the very intense queries. And I want to kind of partition them out. The G3 application understands that I can shard my traffic based by customer ID or product ID. I have a way to shard that out. So maybe I still out, you know, 10 SQL services in the back end, right? And I use maybe two J2E application, and the code, of course, is embedded into the J2E application. So it's a combination of the two. It's up to you, really, how you want to do I would like to try the demo, or might be risky, but yeah, I'm sure there is for best. So, so it's systematic for the database, right? So bots can come and go on the fly. So what happens when I'm storing the data and my bots is Disappear. Yeah, this is a good question. So first of all, pods are mortal entities, as we say. Point is, they they, they are born, and all of, and, and at the end of the story, they die. And we don't try to resuscitate them. This is kind of a philosophy. We try always to bring the application back in place. In this case, we are okay with that. It's like the, the mode two IT. We have, this is kind of the architecture model. So when the pod dies, the state is lost. So that's the reason why the platform allows you also to attach storage to a process or pod. So there is a set of capability to attach, to claim a piece of store, right? It's kind of actually a body claim. So, a, so the way you, so you would go in up and you build up, you, you actually run MySQL and you attach maybe a file system, right? Which is defined in the volumes. Right? And this attachment allows you, for example, to you know, bring up your SQL with data inside, right? Because the data files are now attached. Should the pod die, the platform understands that what it does, it detaches the store, right? It reattaches to another pod that is going to be started up. So the container is run. At the installation phase, the pod is reattached. So your pod now changes or maybe be cluster node to node because maybe the node is failing, right? But it doesn't matter, right? Because the cluster observes as probes 
where they keep running against every container. And when you see something not running, you say, oh, this is attached to a claim volume. I'm going to take the same image from the registry. I'm going to spin it up somewhere else. I reattach the volume. Essentially, your, your database gets back online. So MySQL can recover. So MySQL recovery just starts again with the, with the file system. I press the micro rounds on another machine, another node. But it doesn't matter because virtually it's connected to a store, like you would attach a SAM point or an S point to another ser server, right? But via NFS, for example, you still see the file system. So then you define the problem of the Maya and massive world, but they're together before and apart. But in that specific model, you cannot really scale to multiple ports, right? Because then each MySQL would be like multiple process running on the same storage then? Well, it's up to you to define the way you attach the storage to the genesis, right? It's really up to you. So the infrastructure does not know if SQL 1 attaches to volume 1 and SQL 2 attaches to volume 2, or SQL 1 and 2, they're both reading in the same file system. So it also all depends on the architecture of the component you're running. There are components that are able to share a file system, some other they don't, they can't. They, they, they kind of start writing on each other, right? Yeah. Essentially, they corrupt everything, right? This is given by the architecture of MySQL itself to understand replicas or peers. So every component has its own way to be deployed, right? Kind of best practice. Could be a MongoDB that understands how to shard out different instances, or maybe MySQL is not able to. You know, so, it's more, so the platform will not know, right? Even though what is interesting, what is up and coming, minutes, uh, what is up and coming is uh, the platform will be able to self tune, for example, this component. So, a database will be able to understand how much uh, process to give or bandwidth to the IO system. So, it's fairly, fairly sophisticated. So, what I didn't mention, why we put this stuff all in containers, the reason that we've been containerizing, and containers not being like something new with Docker. We've been using containers for probably say it's a, dec a decade. Maybe somebody heard about Linux spaces uh, and, uh, and C groups in Linux. Well, you know, this is containers 1995, 19. So it's nothing new. The fact that we actually, as a matter of fact, OpenShift uh, version 2 for that had, had gears based on C group and and, uh, and uh, C Linux for security. When Docker specification came out, we say, you know, we always been, or have always been wanted to follow standard and also be participating. So, you know, okay, this is a good standard, we're gonna participate, we stopped everything, we actually rewrote the architecture, but the element of the connectivation always been there. So for us it was a easy rewrite because again Docker relies on C groups and namespace and also on top of this we layer the security with C Linux, which we deem is the way to run in production everything. So by default OpenShift will always run in security mode. Uh, should we try to do the demo or we have other questions? I don't know if the demo is going to work, but I'll try. I want to show you the elements if, uh, if you're interested. Uh, first of all, you can download um, the platform from, from the internet. Um, So, um, if you are interested to okay, this is the, the website for Origin, this is the public website, it's the open source, you can download it. There are many ways you can download and having uh, the load of your, your computer. In the real life, you have multiple nodes, multiple routers, of course we do a high available scale, which is for you know, enterprise class. But for the, tech, for the developer, you can actually use all the elements within one single computer if you want to. <clears throat> Again, open C, uh, you can run in a VM, you can run on your laptop, uh, or you can run on an Amazon or, or Google Cloud. Um, I wanted to show you quickly, um, let's see, this definition is... So uh, this is the definition, but it doesn't help me. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to show you the interface. Um, doesn't even, it doesn't even. Yeah. So 
OpenShift, uh, uh, I'm using actually the open source version, the origin. Uh, I have the corresponding one running actually on Amazon. I can show you the Amazon where you have the kind of the enterprise class with multiple servers and multiple nodes. He runs all, this runs only on my laptop here on my Mac. Um, so we define project. The project that calls on namespace in Kubernetes is the way you define this is this is the play of my developer. It could be a team of developers having one project. The project can define parameters like you know how much CPU you want to give to them, how much resources you want to give to them, and also a lot of you know um, fine tuning in terms of you know roles and 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and access controls. So if I go inside um, a project, for example, this is the project that I would like to uh, to show you. Um, let me see actually if okay, let me see. Okay. This is a case where I, uh, I have started, I have compiled uh, the OpenShift 3 MFB parts application and now it's up and running. I have a pod running. This is the way that you can see. I can scale a pod up, for example, if this corresponds to a command. What I'm doing, I'm taking a pod that is referring to an image and I am now running two instances, right? I could have done the same with an API or with the command line. Again, I can scale up maybe four times, right? Application understands this, this situation, this request goes out, gets the image and the product somewhere. Of course, it's one node, it's my laptop, but in reality, you should, you should actually explore the opportunity to run a cluster. Now, let me see, let me show you something. The, uh, the, the pod itself as a service is the definition of a service. The service encapsulates the fact that we have Traffic incoming and outgoing is an HTTP server, so pod 8080 is defined as the entry point. So 8080 is inside, and also is externalized outside. But they could, for example, easily say, you know, my application runs on port 8081 inside, and then when I externalize it with port 80, it's all a matter of configuration. So configuration are accessible through the command line, or this definition doesn't really help me because I wanted to. Can do these files in YAML form are a way to describe a service, for example. So you can actually inject one of these files literally into the application, right? You can find the YAML file or a JSON file, and you push into the, the cluster. The cluster understands this is type service. So what we'll do, right? Kind service, API version one, and then what you do, it instructs the platform to create, for example, a proxy which takes the port 80. 8080 outside and reroutes inside of port 80. And it's connected to an application called OpenShift. I mean, I want to go into the details because there's a lot of, a lot of semantics in here. But what I wanted to mention is that everything is defined into an object that is also serializable into YAML or XML or JSON file. Finally, as I mentioned, uh, I can access this application until I define a route, and a route is the way to define how I click on the route. So essentially now what happened, my, uh, by clicking here, my browser actually went, jumped into this link. So this link is a hot link on the route. So parts and maybe parts is now an application that I'm running inside the container is visualized actually on the, on the browser. So this application is interesting. It's just a demo application that shows where the, the, uh, the major um, basketball team uh, are in the US. And this is just a map. The web application uses actually a leaflet uh, open source to visualize and allow me to navigate around. But what I don't see, I don't see anything because I'm expecting the database to provide the location for the parts. So this application is not yet connected with, with the database, I mean, the MongoDB, which is running actually somehow in the, so I don't want to go into the top of show you, right? The MongoDB is another application, another pod that is running, right, with the, my application. And it's up and running, I know, because it's one here. I wanted to show you how to create this from scratch, but I don't think we lost the time, right? Um, five minutes, two minutes? Yeah, three minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Two minutes is really tight. Let me show you quickly the... So OC is our magic command.
Okay, uh, I'm, I'm within my project that I just instructed you see to give me everything that is regarding this process, right? this, this project. So I know by winning it's a little cryptic initially, but you know, I mean, try to decode with you. Um, so, um, okay, there is a bit, <coughs> There is a, a, a there is a build configurator object called OpenShift uh, three three MLB parts, and uh, and ties some source code that is from Git. <coughs> there are also um, some builds that has been happening in the past. Actually, one failed, right? And one completed, right? So there is a full history of what has been happening in during every process. So I can actually go in, into something that. In theory, it doesn't exist anymore because it failed. But just because of the, <coughs> me, the platform architecture, everything is maintained over time. And eventually, what I see all the way down that I have pods finally. This is the, the product configurators and pod are down here. And those are essentially my application that I've been running. Some of them went into other stage, but I see uh, that I have some of them running. One is my application here and is uh, my goal going to be as well running here. So, um, it, it, it takes a little more time to go through this, right? So, what, what I, uh, let's leave it at that, right? If any of you is interested, I know I've been talking to, um, to Frag, I mean also interested to do a workshop where we go step by step into it, right? There's a lot to, digest here, but I hope I could have given you an idea the way we kind of can encapsulate this function or what I call microservices. Microservices, I don't want to use the word as well because, you know, I understand the buzzword as so, hey, microservice is yet another buzzword, but what is the interesting fact? If you are able to take these capabilities or use cases or user stories in the agile methodology, right, I have a way essentially to create a, a possibility for developer to use and to reuse components right away. Example, in this my project again, I might able to use a catalog of components, right, that are out of the box from the platform. So I need to run something in Java. Well, you know, I have, um, I have, for example, a messaging system here, or something is based on Java, or maybe I use Perl. I don't have, I have a Python application. Well, you know, I have a three, four, which version you want, so I can create. You know, a cavern of entities, this is middleware, right? So languages, of course, are usually already pre present. But I might be able to have something more interesting where some, some of yours, some of you, might actually uh, provide you know, let's see if I have here. See? Maybe I have a template. So the application itself is now being templatized. Right, and it's provided to me as a service model, right? So it tells me, oh, I know that I need to uh, have this application called this. I, what is the Git repository for for the source code? So I would, for example, point to my uh, Git. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up in one minute. This is my application in GitHub, right? So I will essentially go in here and uh, get a URL of this. And this is happening to be, now I see what. Okay, I'm gonna copy this. And let's go back to the. Okay. So I'm going to define that my application is the code. The J3 code is actually available over the source code of the repository on Git. And um, I can also define way if I need to, maybe it's a very you know, time consuming process, but I could to define this what I can keep in my organization, a Maven repository typically backed up by, for example, Nexus. And then eventually, um, you just run it, mobile user, user. Password, password. You go. So let's see what it can kind of route. Uh, it's fine. Okay, let's see what is happening now. It's a bit with partial errors, but 
um, yeah, because I, I put in the same, in the same situation. So we could go over that the workshop. Yeah, but we need to run this on workshop. What happens actually creates a lot of elements that should be stuck in the build, stuck in the deployment, stuck in the construction of a service, connecting the service to the router, and eventually, all being together, it becomes your application. So what I wanted to show you, uh, now we're running out of time, that you as a developer can, fi can finally create your application, create all the components, and create a recipe that you can put in a catalog. So the next developer, right, you go in the catalog and see you know what these are a template, right? Three parameters at the most, maybe some defaults. You can reuse it right away. This is phenomenal in my point of view. It goes back into accelerating the software life cycle for all of us working on collaboration. So collaboration happens, of course, in the source code repository where we all check in and out and we know how to do. This is old school, right? But it finally happening also in a catalog and a runtime where I have discoverability of each other components. And also, that's it. <laughs> Time is up. All right. So welcome if you want to uh, to the the, the, um, uh, the workshop. I would like maybe to see who is interested. So if you're interested, I will put myself at work. If you're not interested, you can go online. Of course. Showing this Red Hat Roadshow at Google on uh, Wednesday. Next week. Next week. All right. Yeah. It's a great that you bring it up. So what happened? We have been launching formally. OpenShift on Google Cloud. So if you're interested, uh, December 5th, correct? Uh, 7th. The December 7th, thank you. December 7th at Google New York City, we are showing showcasing OpenShift on Google Cloud at Google New York City office. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.